Hi, my name is Lalit Gupta from ICLIF Leadership and Governance Center. I am here at LISA 2018. I had a chance to catch up with Dr. Julia Kim, who heads the Gross National Happiness Program for Bhutan. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that in today's world, which we call as open source era, right? Yes. Uh, where we are more connected with devices uh, than with our own loved ones and our own uh, inner self, right? Yes. Uh, how does that relate to happiness at personal, organization, or uh, the country level? I think there's a profound relation, and uh, it's not a very healthy one. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they talk about addiction now, and I think for many people it is an addictive behavior, the amount of time on social media or on our devices. Um, but it's so early now that we don't have the laws and regulations and the policies to guide us. Mm -hmm. So in that gap, I think we need to make those laws and policies ourselves. And I see parents trying to do that with kids. Mm -hmm. I see um, schools and teachers trying to do that with students. And I think the workplace can be a way to do that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, for some of our programs um, with business leaders, one of the things we first do is uh, detach them from their mobile de device and put them in nature. Right. And I tell you, people start sweating and their hands start shaking. <laughs> and we literally have to put them into a, a box and say, right. And that, but once they do that, and then they spend half an hour in, or half a day really in silence in mm -hmm. a forest, mm -hmm. they start to reconnect with themselves. Right. And they start to realize that a lot of the times they reach them their, for their phones, it's mm -hmm. more of a compulsive behavior right. than out of a real need to know whether there is another message there. Right. Right. So I think there's ways we can start to shift it. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to. It's, yeah. I think it's having a profound effect on our mm -hmm. connectivity and our happiness. Right, right, right. And uh, you know, one of the things that you talked about was, you know, as the countries and uh, move from being underdeveloped to developed, and you uh, mentioned this concept of overdeveloped. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about that. I thought that was fascinating. So it was almost there was a part of me that was resistant to the idea of thinking that because it seems so counter to what mm -hmm. we think of it in terms of development and. But I couldn't avoid it, you know, as I would move between South Africa and the United States or Bhutan and Europe. I couldn't help but contrast the levels of development and the levels of community, happiness, time use, well-being. And I think it makes sense because nothing apart from a cancer cell continues to grow forever. At a certain point there is a limit and a size that is natural where um, the, the shape and the, the field of growth serves the whole and is not destructive. Right. And so I think many of our politicians, many business leaders feel forced to say growth is up, growth mm -hmm. is up, growth keeps going up. Mm -hmm. But it's not sustainable and it's not natural and now we know it's not healthy, mm -hmm. the planet or for individuals. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 uh, it's a myth that we need to start to demystify. Right. I think the other example I like to give is um, we all like to eat, we all have our favorite food. But we all know that it's possible to overeat. Mm -hmm. And if you love chocolate cake and mm -hmm. you have one piece, delicious, go to bed, feel, feel fine mm -hmm. the next day, eat half that cake mm -hmm. and you've overeaten and mm -hmm. you know it, you don't feel well mm -hmm. and, and it has consequences the next day. Mm -hmm. So there is an overshooting the mark. Right. And I don't think it's a sign of failure to say, let's look at what else we want to grow mm -hmm. or what mm -hmm. kind of growth do we want in our country mm -hmm. right. or in our company. Mm -hmm. So when the countries, uh, they move from, let's say, being developed to overdeveloped, what is the core trick that they're missing? What is it that they need to think about? What is it that they need to do differently? Mm. Well, I, I think that new measures are important mm -hmm. because we like to respond to numbers. We mm -hmm. like graphs and charts. Right. We like to see things going up. Mm -hmm. But what if instead of just pay, uh, looking for uh, GDP growth or looking at financial growth. Mm -hmm. um, not that those aren't important, but what if we were to say that is just one part of what we're measuring? Mm -hmm. And we also want to measure happiness and well-being. Mm -hmm. We also want to measure social impact. We want right. to look at impacts on environment. Mm -hmm. And we raise up the importance and visibility of those measures. Right. Then that starts to shift mm -hmm. our goalposts. It shifts mm -hmm. how we behave. Right. I think measurement is important. Right, right. And you also talked about uh, meditation. Right. Yes. What is the role that meditation plays, uh, not just at the individual level, but also at the organization or the country level? Mm. It's a great question. You know, I think 
an organization can be seen as uh, just a neutral body mm -hmm. or it can be seen as a living system, mm -hmm. a living system composed of human beings interacting with technology and forth, so forth. So to what extent is that living system conscious and mm -hmm. aware? Right. And um, that depends on the leaders and the people within mm -hmm. that um, organization. So to me, meditation is coming to know your own mind and your own mm -hmm. heart. Right. And in the same way that technology often pulls us away from that, pulls us externally, I think meditation is a kind of inner technology for coming to know ourselves better. Mm -hmm. And if we're operating from that space of more awareness and consciousness, we can't help but transmit that through our, our relationships and our conversations with mm -hmm. others. Uh, we can't help but bring that awareness into the kinds of decisions that we're making. Right. In this conference, we've talked a lot about the moral compass. Mm -hmm. How do you know what your moral compass is if you're not really connected to yourself? Right. If you mm -hmm. don't feel that kind of contraction in your gut when you know you've made a bad decision, one mm -hmm. that isn't going to benefit people. Mm -hmm. So I think as Richard Davidson has said, Dr. Richard Davidson, we should be exercising and training our minds the same way do we do with our bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through this whole period where everybody has a gym membership Right. and is happy to show off their biceps and mm -hmm. their six-pack. Mm -hmm. So what would the equivalent of that look like if everybody started working on training their minds in compassion mm -hmm. and mindfulness um, so that we can bring that into the world? Mm -hmm. Probably nobody will see the six-pack in your mind, yeah. mm -hmm. but they will notice that you are more kind, right. you seem more grounded, mm -hmm. you don't get so frazzled by the day-to-day. Mm -hmm. -day. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, a really important time for us to start making use of the very ancient meditation techniques that are there, yeah. combined with the very modern neuroscience that tells <coughs> us that it's possible to, to make yeah. progress.